All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for staying. We appreciate it. You are in for a treat this afternoon because you stayed. And don't forget door prizes at the end. Don't go anywhere. All right. I have the privilege of introducing Miss Gail Danley today. Ms. Danley is a slam poet and bereavement specialist who's been engaging young hearts in the process of writing and sharing feelings for the past two decades. She studied journalism at Howard University, which she told me today is the real HU. Evidently not hit. I, don't shoot the messenger, I'm just telling you. And received a master's degree in communications from Syracuse University. She's been covered by 60 Minutes, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Baltimore Sun. She is also a formal nation, former national and international poetry slam champion. And we are so fortunate to be able to have her today. I actually had the pleasure of working with Gail personally uh, many moons ago when I was an English teacher in Maryland. And she has just stayed in my mind ever since. Um, I vividly remember sitting in our auditorium, and I was a middle school teacher at the time, with about 200 6th through 8th graders. And you know, of course, they come in and they're slumped in their chairs and they don't want to be there because they don't want to be anywhere. <laughs> you know that's true. And they're kind of listening to her and they're trying to talk between themselves because they think all adults are like deaf and blind and we can't see and hear what they're doing. And then she began. And it was like magic happened. And she started talking and I saw eighth grade boys sobbing, crying into their hooded sweatshirts. It was, and I'm, I mean, it was an amazing experience. So when I became conference chair, I knew I had to have her. Uh, so I have been waiting for this moment to introduce you all to this amazing woman. If you've never experienced slam poetry or the energy and the deep emotion it invokes, you are in for a treat today from the best of the best. So thank you for being here, Gail. It's a dream come true for me, and it's an honor to share you with a room full of incredible school counselors who create connections for kids every single day. So please join me in welcoming Gail Danley. She laid it on a little thick there, didn't she? <laughs> oh, man. When I was in second grade, I colored everything black. That's so this girl, this beautiful girl, named Cosetta Sims. Y'all say a name for me. We down south. Let me hear it. Cosetta. Cosetta. We're down south. Come on. <laughs> Come on now. Bring it up from the belly. Say Cosetta, Cosetta. Sims. Sims. I used to give her all my crayon. Red and yellow and purple and green and blue and lavender because I wanted her pictures to be beautiful, like I thought she was. All day long in my little desk, I used to sit and I used to stare at Cosetta. You know what she looked like? Y'all know Taylor Swift. <laughs> Covered in chocolate. <laughs> she had one ponytail kissing each of her shoulders, separated by a part so straight her mama must have used a ruler to make it her mama. The magician, ta-da. Her mama knew how to oil and how to brush and how to plait a little black girl's hair and make it grow two inches every two minutes. I, you know what? I used to imagine Corsetta's mama combing her hair every morning and whispering, mama, love her baby into the ribbon. Can I be honest with y'all, please, this afternoon? Dirty dishwater was the only mirror I ever saw. Even my dishwashing liquid was mean to my little hands and my own hair. None of us likes our hair. We think about our hair too much. My hair, never cuddling next to the yarn, my mama would twist on it at night, my mama. Mama would slam dunk my head to the floor. Mama would put two pigtails on my head. Mama would make me go to school. 
looking like a Teletubby. Listen, and she'd slide a stocking cap on top of the pigtails to make the pigtails sit down. So for the two of you in here who know what a stocking cap is, I would go to school with that little stocking cap line. <laughs> Circling my peanut head. Look at Gail. Gail looks funny. Corsetta looked perfect. And I was perfect too. Yeah. I was a perfect loud mouth. I was a perfect smarty. I was perfect ashy knees and elbows. I, I was the perfect one that the teacher would grab in the hallway. Betty Jean, come look at this little girl. Come here, come here. This is Gail Danley. Gail can read on an eighth grade level. Yes, she can, Betty Jean. Read something for Betty Jean. Corsetta never had to read a thing because her hair was silky. <laughs> and she was perfect at playtime. I would run fast because I had to keep up with Corsetta. I remember how her ponytails would smack my cheeks. I remember like her green satin ribbon picking up the green of her velvet dress perfectly. At lunchtime, listen, I would, I would pray that Corsetta would sit as close to me as God would let her. Because I wanted to watch how she would lick her lips. I wanted to go home and practice. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just wanted to look in my mama's medicine cabinet mirror and be, she was so perfect. I never dared ask her to be my friend because I knew that her answer would be, no, you are not worthy. You're not worthy. Well, 10 years ago, I saw Corsetta at the high school reunion. I walked in like I was Beyonce. Guess who I saw first? She couldn't take her eyes off this. I had changed. I had morphed into 140 pounds, give or take, of confidence <laughs> and cleavage and class. I went up to Corsetta and I said, I said, I'm a poet now, Corsetta. Yeah. <laughs> I said, yeah, baby. I go all over the world, and I show young people the power, and I show them the beauty of words. And all Corsetta could look at me and mumble was, oh, well, that's really nice, Gail. I mean, Gail, come on. We always knew that, that you would be somebody special, whatever. You know what, y'all? I didn't even care. I did. I didn't even tell her that 20 years earlier, I would have sold my mama just for the chance to be her for three minutes. But you see, some things, even Corsetta didn't need to know. I was in a high school yesterday before I came here. And I told the seniors, right, because they were looking at me the same way you're looking at me. You, you all should see how you're looking at me, like. <laughs> and I told them, I said, whenever you stand up in front of people or whenever you're doing what you're doing, whenever you're, you're, you're doing your job, right, you're being your mission, you should always be lush. Isn't that nice? Lush. I can't stand when I go to church and the preacher says, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm, I don't want to turn to my neighbor and say nothing. <laughs> but I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and I want you to say, baby, I'm lush.
<laughs> when you walk, you know, into the, into the school, right? And you, you take your place and that one, you know, that, that one. She comes to knock at your door because she needs you. And you open and you answer, oh, baby, you are lush. Whenever you are bringing something beautiful to somebody's life that they would ordinarily not receive, you are lush. You're so lush. You're so beautiful when you pull up in the parking lot. And listen, y'all, this ain't no locker room talk. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> listen, when you pull up in the parking lot, you know, you park your car, you just, and you walk in the building, and they say, hey, how you doing? They're so happy to see you. You giving them something they own mamas might not be able to give. You are lush. Martina Lowe made us all afraid of everything. The violent squeak of locker doors slamming, the sly slosh of red jello in a tray held with quivering hands, the malicious wink of portables rusting in an angry sun, maniac hair vacant in spots, no heart in her eyes. Martina Lowe loved two people, the mother who had abandoned her and Shelton Cullens with green marbles for eyes. Shelton also loved me. You see where this is headed. Especially when his garbage man daddy was out on his truck or passed out in his bedroom, door shut. At a lunch, over the hood of my sloppy Joe, Martina found my eyes, screwed her right fist in her left hand. You see what it, this is? A warning shot. You better leave my man alone. My throat rolls up in my mushroom hair. The milk cartons had my back. She never hurt me. Thank God for the cafeteria ladies. Thank God for Shelton, who had told her to stay as far away from me as the distance between a middle-class neighborhood and the projects. Her husband killed her. I never would have wished this on her, but some of us never learn. A screwed palm makes a screwed life. And no man is worth dying for, even if his eyes are as green as the promise of a house with a well-clipped lawn. Isn't that nice? Let me give y'all a chance to applaud. My goodness, you've been holding it in. Go ahead and let it out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ah, I'm sorry. All tight, tightened up, ready. You know what the problem is? I, I have a difficult time sometimes, Brett, separating. I'm just talking to you, right? I'm just sharing these things with you that I can't hold inside any longer. And, okay, now I'm Gail the poet. Now I'm performing. Sometimes that line, same for you. If you're a counselor, it means that you show love. And sometimes, you know, you, you're just reaching out and you're just loving. And sometimes you forget, oh, 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 that, okay, that's right, that's right, that's right. I'm here, I'm here, lush, lush, trying to do this real cool. I got one contact in, so I'm kind of like, <laughs> the other one is under my chair, so Paul, yeah, yeah don't, yeah, okay, good, glad he's gone, I don't want him to kick it. Oh, that's nice. Let's do, let's do, let's do this one. I've been writing a lot lately, y'all. I think it's, you know, as I move through the change, you know what I mean? It's just made me feel like I, like I need to write a lot. So that's nice. I mean, that and the night sweats. <laughs> the 
you know about the night sweat. <laughs> I notice his earrings, diamond knockoffs, standing about a quarter inch from his ears. His hair cut carefully, hugging his young head, skull cap close. He has volunteered to read his poem, but he doesn't. He speaks it. Each word touching air. He tells us how his father is out now. Six stepmoms, he's lost count. He knows his dad is going back any day. Mrs. Gelza swipes the tears off her eyes while I watch how his earrings avoid the light, lay flat against his face, surfacing in and out of bad light. I tell him there's a good chance he'll end up incarcerated too. But he shakes his head, no, Miss Gale, no, not me. That's my daddy's story, not mine. His diamonds flickering. I watch the jewels struggle to catch the light, metal claws holding them in place, hoping to shine. Um, I write all the time, right? I write coming down 95. Many, many, many years ago, I was hired to come to Richmond and go to Broad Street. Anybody know what's on Broad Street in Richmond? Y'all do y'all like, yeah, really? Yeah, right, okay, wow. And there was no way in the world I was going to have that experience and not write about it. So this poem is dedicated to all of you all who know what's on Broad Street in Richmond. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> The poem says, I am just like you. When it's nighttime and them thug boys walk up on me. I'm just like you. Shoo. <laughs> I cross the street and I, I clutch my pocketbook to my side and I start praying, God, please, please do not let these boys follow me to my car. But this time it's daylight and I'm still scared because I'm at the Richmond, Virginia Juvenile Detention Center, prison across the street. I've been sent here so I can show these 14 little cocoa-colored boys how to express themselves. You know what, y'all? I have a reputation. They say that if Gail Danley can't bring the feeling out of a group of young fellas, you might as well lock them up and swallow the key. I was so scared. The security guard took my keys and locked me behind 12 metal doors. His big old gun on his hip. Sit down, Miss Gail, and just relax. I'm gonna go get the fellas for you. I told him, you take your time. <laughs> First thing I noticed, orange uniforms. Y'all, we gotta do something about this. I digress. Orange uniforms, broken eyes, disorganized hair, and I notice how the fellas keep their hands at the base of their spines even though they don't have any handcuffs. So the security guard says, sit down and shut up. This poetry lady gonna do a poem for y'all. <laughs> Should have sent him a little bio. So I stood up right, my knees were knocking like a pot of popcorn, and I did my poetry, because this is my job. Okay, so I started with the poem about this librarian dude I used to date with the bunions and the, and the hammer toes and the, and the crust at the rim of his foot. <laughs> and the fellows started laughing, right? <laughs> then I did my mama poem. And I got real close to them because I wanted them to see what a black woman smells like when she's not scared anymore. I wanted them to write anything. Pencil and paper, boys, it's time. Get it all down. Security guard said, no, it's time for you to go. Gail. I told you before you came in here 
these boys don't get pencils. I told you that. I told you pencils are considered deadlier than guns. You're done. But I watched a tear creep down a little boy's cheek. So I waited a bit, and sure enough, he came up behind me. Yo, Miss Gail, I know you got to go. You know that you know that poem you did about your mama dying. My mama dying. I wish I could go see my mama. to say to him. What do you say? I mean, every word I had ever written was crashing at my feet like glass breaking. How about you write your mommy a poem? I bet your mommy would like the, come on, y'all. Who am I kidding? He, he doesn't have a pencil. It didn't matter. I was just a grant that someone had written. I got my jacket and got to that parking lot there. And as I cranked up, I heard those cell doors slamming. I'll never be the same. I'm just like you guys. I carry them boys' stories home with me at night, too. Just like you. I'm in the bank. And I think about Dante, and I think about Ashley, and that poem she wrote about her cancer. I'm, I leave my house and I say, God, please go with me today. Please help me say something that's going to save somebody's life. Hoping that this one time, that young man down there in Richmond is going to finish his sentence. Thank you for that, y'all. I'm not the only one who can do that, right? I was a little surprised that Brett didn't say, and while you're here, Gail, we want you to do a workshop too. This is, this is just half of what I've been gifted to do. I like teaching too, just like you all do. I like sitting down with folks and saying, look, you can write too. Look, let me show you. No, 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 don't worry about perfection. This ain't about rhyming. We have lives to save. Maybe next time I come in and we can go to a room and you can bring your notebooks and I can show you how to do this. How to put yourself out there and your passion. Oh, beautiful. Look at you, so sexy. <laughs> Look at you. Let me do a few more and then I'm gonna drive back to uh, Silver Spring. Are you all okay? You, you, you good? It's been a, yeah. Been a little rough lately, hasn't it? We still getting up every morning. Am I the only one in here who has lost a mama? Let me see. Don't be ashamed. But can I see who else? Lord have mercy. Sometimes you don't even know your name, but you look in the mirror because mama is the one who gives you your name. <laughs> mama is the one who gives you your identity. Mama is the one who made you. So when you lose her, when I lost her, I have spent these, let's see, she died in 89. That's been a while. I've been without her longer than I was with her. I ain't never getting over that. 
And you know what? The children, they, they, when they lose their mamas, they have a hard time too. You know that. They come to you. They come to you. Keep the door open. This is, keep the door open. This is for all of us in here who have uh, had to wave goodbye to somebody and you wish you had gone first. Oh, man, that woman doing all that sad stuff. You got your mascara and things on. I'm sorry, ladies. <laughs> Next time you know. <laughs> Coming in trying to look good. I have what's left of you, Mommy, in my hands. I got two pearls, and they shine like my memories of you, Mommy. The pearls catch the light. And in their reflection, Laverne, I, always keeping your name in my mouth. I can see in my first pictures. I was six months old, Mommy, when you decided you could no longer live without me. You couldn't have any children. I was her big sister's baby girl, but all she wanted was a daughter. I got a Lucille, give me Gail. <laughs> and she had me. She put me on her shoulder under a green blanket. And from that moment on, nobody ever called us auntie and niece. Everybody called us mother and daughter. Two pearls is what I have left of you, mommy. Look, mommy, I ate all my food. You know what, daddy, if you hit my mama again, I'm gonna kill you because don't nobody hit my mama. That's my mama. Nobody hit my mama. Some nights I would escape and go to my girlfriend Frida's house and play Monopoly until the street lights come on, until mama came home. Mama came home to Frida's front door with a belt in her hand. Don't you ever stay out after dark again unless I say it's all right. Do you understand me, Gail? I worry about you. Mama's music dancing out the radio. Uh, I guess you say what can make me. I can't believe y'all making me sing this by myself. We're going to try it again. I guess you say I got it. Mama. My mama hit five parked cars that day, but my mama <laughs> made seven little nappy headed children love her more than nihilators and lemon drops. Two pearls, two pearls, and my satin blue prom gown. And my mama ironing that gown flat like a coffee table. Mama made us margaritas in the 12th grade, but shut, I just thought about that. <laughs> Hurry up and get dressed. You're so slow. You're going to be late for your own funeral. Put this little dress on. You look mighty pretty over there, Gail. You're my daughter. They said it was lung cancer. They said they would remove a little section of the left lung and then my mama would be okay. My mama began to cough and she never stopped. I watched a 49-year-old woman turn 70, melting before my eyes in a wheelchair. I didn't know what to do. I, I, I wanted to shake the wheelchair. I wanted to take the hospital bed back to the hospital. It didn't belong in her bedroom. I have two pearls, y'all, because Laverne Bradley loved me. I have two pearls for that red wool coat she gave me that not even Jesus could make me give away. I have two pearls, one for the life that she gave me. 
and one for the life that I gave my three children because I wanted to be somebody's good mother. So the classroom was, was really dark, right? And I was watching a film. I didn't want to see my roommate come into the classroom. It was so cold. Excuse me, Gail, I have bad news. Gail, Gail, excuse me. Your uncle called Gail. He said you need to get home very quickly. I ran through that Syracuse snow. It was so cold, right? So I was running. I was trying to catch up with mama. <laughs> I fell on the snow. I left my knees left a tiny trail of blood. I was trying to get to her. So that she could hold me in her arms. And memorize my smell for the rest of her life. They laid her body down in pink. Mama had a mole on her forehead. I never knew it was there. I, I kissed it. Amira put two pearls on my mommy's ears. And they closed the casket and they took, they took her Keep your door wide open. You don't know what your children are going through. I took those two pearls and I enfolded them inside my heart where they will rest and shine and hurt and write and love and live on forever. Y'all touch your hearts for me. Come on, let's just. That's all we kind of got left right here. It's right there. It's right there, baby. That's just right there forever. Everybody we've ever lost is just right there. inside our hearts. I'm gonna do one more poem for you because I can't, this is the last session. I can't let you go home like this. Um, <laughs> you'll be mad at me. I left a school last month and it was so beautiful. You know, I got to the last poem and I was like, right here inside our hearts. And then I went outside and my tires were slashed and I know who did it. I know who did it. It was the math teacher. And it was. I know. I know it was Mr. Johnson because he didn't want to go back to fifth period all emotional, all messed up. Are you all okay? I'm just saying. I'm just saying, be lush and keep the door open. And you know what? When you're having a drink later on this evening, <laughs> have a few drinks. You know, have a drink. Have a drink. And your friends, you know your friends, the one making all that money, ain't doing nothing. Work an hour and 10 minutes a day. And your car is in the parking lot, like, like that's where the car lives, right? And they start talking, you know, girl, you got all that education. I don't know why you over there at that school with them bad kids. <laughs> don't even listen to it. Don't even listen. I'm not with bad kids. I'm with beautiful kids. 
I need me. And I'm there. I'm so fulfilled. You see, you're having your third drink at this point. <laughs> Feel good. <laughs> Sleep good at night knowing you touched somebody's life. Let me see here. I'm going to do, okay, I'm going to squeeze. I know we got to go home. I'm going to squeeze in too because this one is funny and you need something funny. And so I'll do this one. I'll do one more and I'm going to sit down. <clears throat> no. Y'all say no. From the old English meaning hell no. As in hell no, I don't want to eat lunch with y'all. What is this, junior high? No. The prettiest word a person can say. No is the new black. <laughs> Folks who are 50 plus wear it best. A sharp burgundy, <laughs> love it. A sharp burgundy scarf thrown about the neck to protect the vocal cords. As in, no. <laughs> oh, I better not say that. I do that line later. We do that. We do that after a few drinks. No is broad shouldered. No stops arguments and trains. No kills resentment. And after a navy blue night of rum punch, no stops hands and teeth and air. No. Say it with me. Come on, y'all say no, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Awesome. Such a pretty little word. It's like a roller coaster on your tongue. It spreads butter on your inner cheeks. It's like oil on a stop sign. You should try it sometime. Will you join my club? No. Will you rinse the plate? No. Will you take me? No. Do you like me? No. It's the ultimate intense. <laughs> it is the ultimate intensifier. Yes, it's like a wimp. Yes, yanks the air from your throat builds resentment. Yes, sets you up like pins for the bowling ball. Takes away your power. Weakens your spine. Takes too much energy. Takes too much. Did you like this poem? <laughs> All right, one more and I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna do one more poem. I'm going to sit down, I promise. Man, I'm giving the cameraman a hard job. <laughs> Mr. Kevin Knowles, y'all, he's local if you ever need him for your event. So there, there he is. Wave at them, Kevin. <laughs> my husband and my husband's poet friends write lots and lots and lots of poems about superheroes, right? And since I missed the superhero class, I sit in the back of the poetry reading feeling unhip and uncool, right? I, I don't know them. I don't care to know the superheroes. Here's my list. You ready? Number one, my Aunt Ruth. Because she had this little black church pocketbook and it grew dollars, baby. I got a little $50 for you to take back to school. And those dollars turned into my master's degree. So we better applaud Aunt Ruth. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> Listen, superhero number two, my Uncle Claude. Uncle Claude is 85 years old and nine and a half months pregnant. <laughs> Uncle Claude means it when he tells his wife Ernestine, you know what, you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Been with you 62 years. And you think you gonna walk out that door? I will drag a dirty blanket up beside you and I'm gonna sleep wherever you go. <laughs> Superhero number three, my poodle Jocko. He looked like a curly afro sitting on the, on the green grass of home. Jocko never stopped waiting on my yellow school bus every day. 
3.17 and a half p.m. There he would sit. Even when he got old and arthritic, even when he could no longer hold his pijaco, waited for me. What number am I on? I'm on three. I'm on four. Aunt Ruth, Uncle Claude, Jocko, keep up. <laughs> Number four. <laughs> well, yeah, because when my daughter's father chose crack and street corners and nighttime over me and the baby girl, I bundled her up and slid her inside the car seat. And together, we escaped. I don't have a cape, y'all. We don't need a cape, y'all. We are gorgeous, y'all. We don't need S's across our chest. My daughter is coming home tonight for the weekend, right? She's 20. And when I open that door and it's her standing there, She's going to look at me like, that's, that's my mama. You my girl, mama. You know, you know I tell her, I'm not your girl. <laughs> she looks at me like that, like, thank you, mama. I love you, mama. I really do. So my husband and his little poet friends, they can keep their Batman and their little Supermans and who am I leaving out? Spider-Man. She's a good one. Because I'm going to stay right here on the ground, y'all. <laughs> Just like Wonder Woman. Y'all, thank you so very much. Thank you for... Thank you, Brad.